So this panel is the Healthy City panel, and um, I'm gonna just run through one-liners real quick so you know who these folks are. You already know Jennifer, I think, from last <laughs> night, if you were here. She's with the British Columbia Centers for Disease Control. Correct. Then we have uh, Professor Eric Bing, who's with SMU. He's also a doctor who's traveled and written about medicine across the globe. We have Seema Yasmin with the Dallas Morning News, a doctor as well as a journalist, epidemiologist. And then we have Regina Montoya, who is the chair of the Task Force on Poverty, which Dallas Mayor Mike Rawlings started in 2014? Last year. Or last year, 2015. And then at the end here, John Seibert, who is the president of City Square, which is um, a nonprofit here in Dallas that fights poverty. So without further ado, and I can remind you who they are if you forget, um, I want to start by outlining well, last night we heard great ideas. We heard an idea from Alma uh, Guillermo Prieto about transforming Dallas into a walkable city, a city where libraries are glamorous places put in neighborhoods that no one visits. We heard from Sarah Prevet on the entrepreneurial city about transforming schools into sandboxes um, where kids can fail and experiment and innovate. And Jennifer's idea was really about health and how we can use data to transform our cities and to create Dallas as a, to create Dallas into a united city using data. Now, before we react to that idea, let's paint a picture of how healthy of a city or unhealthy of a city Dallas is, because we need to know where we're starting from. So quickly, thoughts on where Dallas is, and I'm gonna jump over you just because I know you don't live, ha live here, so I'm not gonna make you respond to that. I did see a lot of freeways. Yes, yeah, I bet you could make a judgment. So, um, Eric? I, I think one of the things that, that, that plagues Dallas um, is things that you know, plague many big cities um, is that we have lots of preventable diseases. We have a city that's divided in terms of income and a city that's divided in terms of race. Um, and so um, there, there's some major challenges that we have to overcome if we're really going to become a healthy city. Seema? It's hard to answer that question overall, saying is Dallas healthy, is it unhealthy, because I would answer by saying tell me your zip code, tell me where you live in Dallas, and then I'll tell you whether you live in a healthy place or an unhealthy place. And we can literally use your zip code to diagnose you and to predict how long you will live. And one of the really heartbreaking things about that is you might live in a neighborhood in Dallas that has a grand old life expectancy of 85 years, but very, very close to where you live, there will be a neighborhood that doesn't have the same amenities and where the life expectancy is a lot lower. So that's the real tragedy, I think, with Dallas. And it's a divided city, sadly, in terms of health. And to follow up on what Seema was mentioning, we have a number of neighborhoods of concentrated poverty, actually 33. These are neighborhoods where the poverty rate is greater than 40 percent. But when you look back at the bigger picture of Dallas with respect to poverty, which is why I'm uh, uh, working on the Mayor's Task Force on Poverty and why Mayor Mike Rawlings has thought of this as one of the most important issues facing Dallas, we have the highest child poverty rate of any city greater than a million in, in the U.S. Almost half of the people living in Dallas live below 185 percent of the poverty level. But I want to be sure that we in, in, in reinforce that these are people that are working poor, who have jobs that are 30 hours, sometimes two 30-hour jobs, but often without benefits, which gets back then to the health amenities that Seema was just mentioning a few minutes ago as well. We work in many of the low-income neighborhoods, and it, it comes down to things like broken sidewalks and stray dogs and no grocery stores. Um, so there are parts of the city where you can go take a jog and you don't think about the risk of having five pit bulls anchored in your backside. Um, that's not uh, the case in many parts of South Dallas. Um, there's not access to grocery stores. Um, they're not safe communities. You can't go to the park because it may not be safe. So uh, there are very real issues that our low-income communities face as far as day-to-day -day realities about health and the like thereof. So there are lots of ways to measure how healthy a city is. You can do it by your disease infection rate of a specific disease. You can do it by how old people live. You can do it by more infant mortality rate. I'm wondering if we are going to attack this problem in looking at how we can use data or have other creative ideas for 
making Dallas a healthier city. How are we going to measure that? What are the ways, the best ways to say, are we making progress? You know, indicators, public health loves indicators. We're always reporting on things, collecting data, and you know, whatever, they're great. But you know what's the most powerful thing is narrative, people's stories. You want to hear from the people living in these communities. You want to hear about their personal experience. That, to me, would move me to action. That, to me, would tell me, is a program working or not? I don't care about where it sits on the dashboard. I want to know what the people feel about this program. Well, I think along with that, I think she's totally right, is that these narratives will move us to action. Um, but we also need to know what we're acting upon and mm -hmm. if it's actually making a difference. And that's actually where I think the data is absolutely critical, um, is that, you know, for our leaders, and I'm not, talk I'm not talking about sort of leaders at the highest part of our government, but leaders in our community, leaders in our neighborhoods, leaders in our households, for us to sort of know where we're going to, uh, the change needs to be made, and if what we're doing um, has any effect, it's really going to have to be from the data that we have. And that's actually why the, the presentation last night was just so brilliant, because it talked about innovative ways that we can use these um, use data to make the decisions that we want, need to make. Now, Eric, Eric's worked in the U.S., California, here in Africa and other countries, the Caribbean. What do you see being done with data right now or opportunities for data here in Dallas that we could take advantage of? Great. So, so one of the things that, that, that Jennifer talked about last night, for those of you who weren't aware, here was, you know, um, how do you combine different data sources and be able to predict where the next problem um, will occur so you actually can be preventative rather than reactive. And, and I think that's actually um, where we have the opportunities. Um, um, this is an entrepreneurial city, as we just heard. Uh, people um, can use the different types of data we have in order to make the change. Um, in, in mental health care, uh, which is my primary focus, um, is um, people with mental health problems will end up in the criminal justice systems. They'll end up in the healthcare delivery system. They will end up in lots of different systems until we are able to combine this different data and be able to make some sense out of it. We're never going to be able to make the kind of change that we need. I can actually speak to a, a, a situation where data has already been beneficial in Dallas yeah. in health. Uh, there's a Health and Wellness Alliance for Children that, that Children's Health has helped convene. Um, and the first issue they tackled in Children's Health was asthma. And so they did a study to find out uh, when most kids are brought to children's ER with asthma issues. And their theory was it would be over the weekend uh, when mom and dad were home with them. Well, what, what the data showed was ER visits for asthma spike on Mondays because that's when kids go back to school and the school nurse says, you're not breathing very well, we need to get you treated. So then they were able to realize that, okay, a frontline uh, defense in dealing with children's asthma is the school nurse, let's empower the school nurses. And so that led to some changes to where Children's Health does telemedicine with the local school nurse. They began to try to find workarounds to legislation as far as how could they have inhalers on site at schools. Uh, so there were a number of then remedies that they were able to use towards treating asthma for kids at school that would keep them out of the ER, but empower the nurses who were the ones that were taking care of them anyway. And one of the ideas that Jennifer mentioned last night was asthma inhalers, I think it was in Louisville, Kentucky, mm -hmm. that are GPS oriented so they can track where in the city kids are using um, asthma inhalers was a great example. What are some other examples of that either Dallas could look to or that maybe you think have specific um, potential here. <laughs> the ones that I showed last night were pretty much it almost. This is a very, very mm. new trend. Cities are just starting to get on the data bandwagon. So the example that I showed from New York with the traffic fatalities, we had the uh, GPS equipped inhalers from Louisville. Chicago's done a lot of work on the, the rat issue and food inspections. Other cities have started to pick up on the food inspection angle too. It's one of their biggest problems. It's one of the few things that's really kind of public health oriented that is under a city's control as opposed to a, a regional public health department. So I think there's a tremendous opportunity to be creative and rather than look to other cities and say, what have people done? You can innovate here. And the question becomes, you know, what's Dallas's 
problem? What's its number one issue that it needs to fix? Louisville, they keep being you know, labeled the number one worst city for allergies in the US, and they're always on the top 10 list of worst air in the state. So you know, what's Dallas's claim to shame? Great question. Yeah. Regina, you've worked here for quite some time with children and uh, across the city. What is the claim to shame for Dallas? Well, I think, I mean, and I'm not sure about the healthy one, yeah. so I wouldn't, uh, I, I do know we have a lot of ozone and red, red days here, and I'm sure all of you know about that as well. But, um, so I, I think I would have to just say on the poverty ones, and clearly it's, it's the issue of, of child poverty. But I think I, I would kind of go back to something that um, John was mentioning as well with respect to some of these indicators and what they mean. Um, you know, not all of this is new news. Uh, we, you've seen these trends in a lot of cities already across the country, and we kind of know sort of trajectories for cities. And I think that's something that we can learn from. But um, I, I, will, I will share with you an observation someone made at one of the conferences I attended a couple of months ago. And as she was hearing some of these numbers that we were talking about, be it asthma, be it, uh, be it any of these other issues, including the poverty, um, and, and the, you know, so many people who don't own their own homes in Dallas. I mean, I think there are bigger issues on housing and um, the food deserts, others that are all interconnected and complicated. But as she looked at these numbers and we said to her, what do these numbers look like to you? And she said, they look like Detroit 10 years ago. And that was a very sobering moment for us as we, um, you know, because you can create um, trajectories and you can create trends from the information that you have. And I suspect that that may be as, as anything as interesting for all of us. But I would also think that it's very important for us to continue this idea of a narrative. Because for so many people, once you start talking about numbers, um, it becomes something that happens in the southern part of Dallas. Or it becomes somewhere away from you. You don't put a face to it. And I would also you know, urge us to remember that it's not just southern Dallas. The neighborhoods of concentrated poverty in Dallas ring Dallas. One of the worst neighborhoods of concentrated poverty is 10 minutes away from North Park, one of our most and largest uh, um, shopping centers. It's 10 minutes away from the park cities. That neighborhood is called Vickery Meadow. It's a very famous neighborhood now because you remember that from when we had the Ebola incident. That is one of the poorest neighborhoods. The newest neighborhood of concentrated poverty is just northeast of that. It's not in the southern part of Dallas. Which brings up a great point about the potential to use data to predict things like infectious disease. And I imagine looking back on when Ebola happened here in Dallas and, and SEMA was a big part of the response in and covering that, um, Vickery Meadow shouldn't have been a surprising place to find Ebola, I would imagine. No, we totally should have anticipated that. And yet we, like you mentioned, you have North Park Center, this really fancy, glamorous mall. So you have these areas of very um, affluent areas next to areas where there's poverty. And then we have this false narrative here that it's only South Dallas where there's poverty. So it's really important to realize where the need is, where public health services should be. And yesterday, Jen talked about silos in public health, which is really embarrassing that public health is actually very broad. It's everything from domestic violence to mental health to strokes and heart disease to Ebola, right? Public health is everything. It's so, so broad. But why do we try and work in these really artificial silos where I just focus on chronic diseases and you just focus on infectious diseases and we're never going to talk to each other as if that's reality. But the other issue, and Jen and I spoke about this a while ago, is privacy. And I think that yes. this whole idea of privacy, we have to protect our data, it's so important that we keep it confidential, actually becomes a big excuse to not getting things done in public health. Amen. And Jen put it really well when we talked on the phone, and she said, you know, from a public health perspective, I think if people realized how much privacy gets used as an excuse, they'd be really shocked. <laughs> and the thing that makes me angry about that isn't just how ineffective that ends up being, but who is that data about? It's about all of us. It's collected about all of us. So who should it belong to? It really should belong to us. And I wish we had more open access systems where data can be shared in a way that doesn't you know, give up your personal information, but shows us where those areas of need are so that we can really put our money where it's needed. Which I think brings up a great point. And as, as a reporter for KERA, I'm often looking for narratives mm -hmm. to tell the stories of numbers, as journalists do because who wants to read a column full of numbers? But it's ironic that it's so difficult to find personal narratives and there's so much hesitancy, I mean, it, I understand, but about telling personal stories about health. So I wonder if there are ideas about how to get people to share their personal stories about health. 
I don't ever find that people are actually hesitant. I think oh, once but you kind of get there, people want to tell you everything and try and get a few <laughs> diagnoses out of you as well, in my case, usually, <laughs> which makes for a fun conversation. But I mean, if you're approaching it through the hospitals, through the doctors, and you're trying you know, to and find that's, that. That's another thing that I really want to get out of is the idea that healthcare and public health is about the healthcare setting. You know, we talked yesterday about for every dollar of US money that goes towards healthcare, Every dollar, only three cents goes towards public health. That means that 97 cents of every one of our healthcare dollars goes to hospitals, goes to doctors' offices and clinics. But we know in public health that 80% of what influences your health influences whether you will get obesity, whether you will have depression, at what age you will die, happens outside of the hospital. It happens in real world settings. It doesn't happen in the doctor's office. So the same for you and I doing medical stories or public health stories you kind of want to go to the hospital as the last resort. You want to be in someone's house. Yeah. And I think it's a struggle when, when you professionalize healthcare exclusively. I mean, our best results in low-income communities have been when we empower the community itself. Mm -hmm. um, so our best work in diabetes education was when we educated a diabetic and then she became so proficient at it that she educated her friends. And so she started this movement of diabetes education, um, and she was much more accessible to her community than a doctor's office. You can, you know, there are plenty of doctor's offices in low-income areas, and even when you put a resource there, it doesn't mean the community accesses it. There's still a disconnect. And so we need ambassadors of health from within these low-income communities. Um, our best work has been when we train community health workers that are from the neighborhoods and they become ambassadors themselves. And so I think we need to deprofessionalize it a little bit, but you know, quit, quit relying exclusively on the, the healthcare systems themselves. We need to empower the people yeah. um, and, and let them be the leaders on the front lines of our communities. You know, I, I couldn't you know, agree more with that. And I think that if, as we demedicalize this and make it more a part of the community, it's the only way we're going to be able to, uh, to begin tackling some of these issues. Um, you, you talk about sort of these community health care worker models. Um, so these are people in the community who are actually working with the community um, and empowering them, so therefore they're taking uh, control of their health. And we've seen this not just here, but we've seen this in Pakistan, we've seen this in Uganda, we've seen this in Rwanda. These are really poor countries, and what they have is a lot of people, a lot of community people, and they use what they have. We need to do the same use the people in the communities who understand the issues, who can talk to the issues, um, and who have some skin in the game. And the skin in the game is their own. And we have to do that in our community because when you think of the percentages I mentioned, you know, 48, 47% of the people who live below 185% of the population, 38% of our kids um, live in poverty. And if you look at many of these hospitals, in, including, you know, some of the pediatric ones, you know, two-thirds of the children will be um, on Medicaid. But if you go out into the community, fewer and fewer physicians are taking patients who are on Medicaid so that there is no opportunity for them to have access to many of these physicians' offices, uh, even in their own communities because of the lack of doctors, because of so few doctors now who are taking it. We have one of the worst percentages of physicians who take uh, Medicaid. Um, so we have to be able to provide that because that is why we have this overuse of emergency rooms. One of the highest uses of the emergency room in these hospitals, for example, in, uh, in the pediatric side, will be here in Dallas. There is no other option. So this idea that Eric and John are mentioning are very good ideas because we have no other option. They have no other option. The Spanish-speaking people in our clinic, some of our patients, they um, created a telenovela that they were able to show to folks in their community. And within this drama was diabetes education. And so they, they created this, this wonderful piece of art that was a teaching tool in their community. We need to empower people in that way. Can I say one thing yeah. about community health workers too, just to jump in on it? Um, I was at a meeting in London in September, and it was sort of a global health group that was getting together to talk about what were the many things that had gone wrong in the Ebola outbreak right from the start. And one of the biggest ones, there were, there were a lot of failures there, but certainly one of the biggest was communication and surveillance. And it, the infrastructure just didn't exist in that region. And community health workers can be an incredibly important 
source of data that's coming from the ground up. If you can organize community health workers, you've got people that are advocating for specific communities, you've got people that are advocating for specific health issues, you might have a community health worker group around maternal health, you might have one on uh, you know, obesity, food deserts, active lifestyles. If you get those people talking to each other in a way that other groups can kind of interact with and, and look at and explore, even electronically, potentially. I mean, we've got this cool surveillance tool called Health Map, which is a totally independent surveillance tool. It was built by researchers at Harvard University. It scans media online. It scans newspapers in every language you can think of on a daily basis. It goes and crawls the internet for things that look like signals of emergent infectious disease. Imagine if you had you know, an online network where community healthcare workers could connect, could talk to each other, could share their stories, say what's working for you, what's working for me, but also roll that into one of these surveillance systems where you're looking for blips. Like, hey, you know, I've seen an unusually large number of babies born with small heads, what could be going on? This is exactly what happened in Brazil starting last fall. Community health workers and physicians were noticing this defect and all of a sudden Zika virus a couple months later you've got a public health emergency of international concern. Boots on the ground and a way to, to listen to those boots footsteps is a potentially really powerful tool. Yeah, and I think you know also sort of along with this is the importance of community health workers and, and technology is that if you have community health workers in the community, you know, um, um, the, uh, one of the things they can do, they, they, a, a cell phone uh, is a, a, a great way where they can actually, they're seeing the issues, they text it in, uh, and then right, right, you have the coordinates, you have everything right there, so we're collecting data um, um, on, on a very easy basis. It also allows them to communicate with the, with the health center that's often far away from these communities to understand what to do, so therefore you have a person in front of you, you can actually help them right then. You don't have to wait for them to go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. Well, we've heard about how Dallas is obviously an entrepreneurial city, and this reminds me a little bit. I don't know if any of you are on LinkedIn or Twitter or any of these other uh, wonderful tools, but you can tell who influencers are. This makes me wonder how, and top companies go after these people. They pay them good money to mention their brands, to mention their products. How do we find the influencers in communities, in health? Maybe we could use data to do that in some way. It's a great question, yeah. Well, I think you know one thing is to find the influencers in health. I think probably the more important thing is just to find the, the influencers um, and then teach them health and mm -hmm. help them understand health. Um, one of the things that was really done in, in South Africa, and most of the work that I do is, is, is um, focusing on poverty, but not just poverty in the United States, it's really all over the place. Um, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, but finding uh, who was getting the most text messages, uh, were people listening to them, and then um, using them to, uh, or um, uh, uh, really um, empowering them to begin text messaging about health messages. Um, when things would then go wrong or people would begin to talk about things, letting them know what to say and how to say it. And then other people began to, to join in that, that, that dialogue. And how did that work? What's that? How did it work? Very successfully, very successfully, um, that people would understand um, uh, how to prevent HIV, what to do, where to go. Uh, and you had these, these key people in the community um, telling them where to go. And it was very, very helpful. And how were those people identified, the key people who were sending out those first messages? Um, um, uh, there's been a number of different ways that, that people have actually looked at this. Um, part of it is uh, who is doing the most text messaging and, and how many people are they connected mm. to. So you can do a lot of text messaging between you know, your, you, you know, your husband or your, your, your mother, but it's actually the, the diversity of that community, how large that community um, is, and is there back and forth. Because if there's back and forth, there means that there's a dialogue going on people are understanding. It's not just a one-way text message. You've got a powerful tool, too, in something called social network analysis, and this is something we actually use in doing some of our outbreak investigations, um, where, especially for diseases like tuberculosis, where, yes, it's an infectious disease, but fundamentally, it's a social disease. So, like, the social determinants of health are no more active, no more, no more active anywhere else than in TB. And what we do in social network analysis is go into a community, we talk to people in semi-structured interviews, and we say, all right, you know, What's, a, what's your day like? Where do you go 
where do you spend time, who do you hang out with, what activities do you do there, because you start to learn not only who are the key hubs in the network, who are the people that are connected to the most individuals, but where are the places they go to, because it's just as important to identify those influencing locations as the influencing people. Where do people go to get their information? Where are they going to be in a state that they're receptive or something? So by going in, and it's almost like uh, kind of old school ethnography and anthropology. You're going into these communities and kind of embedding yourself and saying, all right, what's the social structure? Where are the key nodes in this network? And systemically, that's going to be really important for us to think about in our community because we have a very complicated public health system here. For those of you um, who may not be from this area, Parkland Hospital is a very large, our big public ho hospital. But if you went into Parkland right now, you won't see any children other than those children that were born there and happened to be in the neonatal intensive care unit, the NICU, or who are in the burn unit, which fortunately is very small. So there are no kids in Parkland. And I think then if you think about trying to get your, um, uh, some of the uh, shots that you need to get into school and to be, have all of those kinds of, of, of shots ready, sometimes you don't actually go to Parkland or you don't go to the Children's uh, Hospital either. You go over to the Dallas County uh, uh, area to get your, your shots. We've made it very difficult for people to be able to figure out which parts you need to access. And so we have a very large umbrella of nonprofits then that are providing the help to also support that of which um, our public health system is doing. Something to what Seema had, uh, had mentioned earlier in some of those silos. Not only do we have those silos within the medical area, whether it's infectious or whatever, but we have it even in these areas. You really have to kind of figure out where it is you need to go to access it because it's not necessarily as obvious here as, um, as it would be in other cities. I think that that's a great point. That's one of the reasons that bringing health to people is such an important aspect. And I know, John, that you work with that with, with City Square. What are the locations, the best places to find people when they're receptive, when they're able to hear and receive health care? Well, there's been a, uh, quite a bit of great work done in uh, faith communities. So that um, you, you put a, a nurse in a church or the, the church itself becomes a community of health and um, guides it its people and educates its people towards better health. Um, the barber shops and beauty salons um, are key resources in a number of low-income communities. And so um, we've actually it tested the thought of going in with them and, and doing blood pressure checks to, to check for hypertension. You do um, it while you get your haircut. And their feedback to us was, that was great, but right now do you have any condoms? So um, <laughs> Our community health nurse started providing condoms to some of the barbershops and, and beauty salons um, in our community. Um, so I, I think finding those kind of, where do people go, where do people hang out, um, and then letting those people be um, your educators and your ambassadors um, is really important. Obviously the schools are huge as well, um, and our, our schools need to become uh, communities of health uh, where there's um, integration into you know, the lives of families. Um, and that they can be a great resource as well. Yeah, and, and I think John's you know, t touched on the importance of <clears throat> sort of where uh, you go, but I think it's also important sort of like when, who's going to be receptive? Mm -hmm. um, and often that's going to be a teachable moment. You know, something has happened in the life of this person, and it may not actually have affected them, but certainly it may have affected somebody they care about, and they're receptive to learning. You know, I, I can certainly remember <clears throat> my, my father um, had a stroke, my grandmother had a heart attack, um, and when my blood pressure kept going up, I kept thinking, I have to lose some weight. I have to lose some weight. Because um, I was refusing to get on blood pressure medication. Um, but then my brother-in-law had a, a, a major stroke. And I thought to myself, wait a second. I've been trying to lose this 30 pounds for 30 years. I think this is fossilized fat. <laughs> it's not going any place. I better get on some pills. And I went on blood pressure medication, and my, medica my blood pressure went right down. I'm a physician, I know these things, but it was only when I had that moment that I was receptive to listening to what I knew. Well, let's not wait for everyone's family member to have a stroke, so how do we get them to, to, to act before that happens? Before the tragedy, before, before the, the crisis, before the first Ebola case comes, where is data in Dallas, or what data is possible to even use? What do we have? I don't, I don't know. I mean, what, what access 
what right now is accessible to us and to people to analyze, like you were showing in, in uh, Chicago, mm -hmm. putting data out there so entrepreneurial thinkers can take advantage of it, sort it, see where the problems are. Do we have that? We have it in regards to some problems. As Jen was talking yesterday, and you brought up, was it Chicago that kind of had this open access yeah, yeah. Um, data set where, you know, if you guys weren't here last night, you can basically go on online and find out where, just basically have access to tons of data about your own city, where things are happening, where problems are concentrated. And I was nudging my, my colleague from the Dallas Morning News last night saying, we need that, we need that. And she said, we kind of have it and showed me something on her cell phone, and it's called Dallas 311. I don't know if anyone's used it. I'm not sure, I haven't tried it myself, so I don't know how usable it is, but it was a, a long list of where there were issues with roads, like potholes, or where it was difficult to cross somewhere, where there'd been an accident, and then you could zoom out and then look at it like a map and see there were like different pins in different areas. So imagine if we could do that for health, maybe that's embedded within Dallas 311, maybe it isn't, but that kind of idea where the data's about us, lets us have access, to it. Um, last year, one of our keynote speakers was also from Canada. Um, she talked about innovation, and she said that in one of the provinces in Canada, the mayor was having difficulty balancing the books and saying, you know, we need this much money for this issue and this much money for that issue. And his constituents were like, no, we think the money should go there. And others were like, no, go there. And he was like, you know what, guys, I'm putting the budget online. You figure it out. You help me decide where, if you want money to go towards roads, then tell me how much I should cut from education. And we, I tell my students at UT Dallas this all the time, in public health, we forget the first word in public health is the public. public. So why is the public not part of the conversation? Mm -hmm. Make that data open in a way that still protects privacy and let's all try and solve these big problems together. Mm -hmm. And maybe John, I know you've worked very closely with the folks at PCCI, the part of Parkland that is doing that particularly with respect to the issues of the homeless. And I think there have been some incredibly innovative work that has been done in that area, is my recollection. Uh, yes, in, in terms of homelessness, there's, the Parkland Center for Clinical Innovation is developing a, a database or a software platform that has applications beyond the homeless population. But the basic theory is medical providers and social service providers can use the same database. And so there's a, a medical screen and there's a social service screen, but that it could be a da data portal where we have all the information about a person. So in terms of the homeless, um, now the continuum of care in Dallas is going to a coordinated access where they have a, a, a series of questions that assess vulnerability of a neighbor in homelessness. And so they get a score on the VI spadat, which looks at how vulnerable are they. Well then, instead of cherry picking who you take into your, your homeless you know, shelter or your, your units of housing, you have to start with the most vulnerable. And so access is coordinated. We know who is homeless, chronically homeless, how vulnerable they are, and then together we're gonna to start getting them into housing. And so we have data that's allowing us to pool all that information and try to get more of the most vulnerable homeless into housing. I think one of the issues we face in Dallas is we don't have a platform. We make health private, uh, which is, uh, you know, already been referred to, and Regina's talked about how complicated our public health system is. We, we, too often we don't have some kind of uh, platform where public health officials, I guess, have the authority or the credibility to um, be in the conversation. So for example, on housing, there was a great conversation this week uh, between DISD and the city council about the role that housing policy plays in our education system. And we have a resegregated school system in Dallas and one of the contributing factors is there's not housing for a middle class to live in in Dallas. Um, well, th that's a promising conversation to begin to c connect the dots that housing ha policy has implication for education. Well, it does for health too. And so we need um, somebody that can uh, be given the mic to say, you know, while we're looking at housing policy in Dallas in terms of what it means for education, it has huge implications for health. And if we looked at how much substandard housing is in parts of this city, um, we should be ashamed. Yeah, and one of the things that, that Jennifer talked about both today and yesterday um, is the importance of being able to get that data and use that data. Um, uh, the fact that we now have, you know, PCCI, which is at Parkland, um, even though they talk about clinical innovation, it's really about sort of innovations in data. Uh, and this is a, um, a, a nonprofit that's relatively new, about two, three years, um, and just got um, uh, money from the Cruz Foundation that will really help it, it grow and expand. And those are things that we 
um, the opportunities that we have is that we have um, a center that actually uh, is doing that in Dallas that, that has resources to do it, and now people coming together saying that we, we're going to have to change if we're going to be able to, to, to create a difference. Some of the best data that I've actually seen in health actually comes from the police department hmm. um, in accidents, in muggings, in murders, um, uh, and even arrests. Uh, and so then you can begin to sort of understand, at least from a behavioral standpoint, sort of where crime is happening. And where crime is happening is often where poor health outcomes are also happening as well. Um, and I forgot to mention earlier, we want to hear from you about whether it's data related or other ideas or questions about health in Dallas and how to make it a healthier city. We'll get to questions in just a minute, so jot down notes if you have them um, for individuals. But on that point, I'm curious, what data would you like, Seema? What would you want to know if you could have access to it? If you could dip your hands <laughs> into the silo and just pull out what you wanted, what would you reach in for? Everything. <laughs> Don't I mean, be greedy. I'm an epidemiologist, right? So that's my dream is having access to loads of data sets. And really, I mean that when I say everything, because mm -hmm. health is about connecting the dots. We can't talk about childhood obesity in Dallas until we talk about recess and education or until we talk about what kind of housing children live in. So I can't look at one data set. I need to be able to look at all of them. So I'm a real proponent for us because we are the public. We're talking about our health here. It's not some abstract academic kind of you know thesis I want us all to be able to access that that information and I think uh, I couldn't agree more in terms of this interconnectedness I mean I think when one starts looking at these issues of poverty as an example you do, do start um, immediately recognizing that there are so many variables so many aspects it's a complicated system John mentioned what the DISD in the city of Dallas want to do but you know you think back I mean this is a trend that we've been seeing in Dallas uh, when you see the 70% um, of the Dallas Independent School District is Latino Hispanic 23% African American over 90% of those children um, are qualifying for free and reduced lunches but this didn't happen overnight I mean we had Dr. Hinojosa speak to our task force three months ago and he mentioned when he had been the superintendent uh, of a decade ago, that number was much lower, 80%, um, uh, uh, if, if not even lower than that, and now you've seen these incredible increases. So that's the other reason is that it's so important to have that data because you could have seen that trend happening. And now where do we find ourselves? With a school system that is racially and ethnically segregated, economically segregated, and now you have kids that they don't even know what they don't know at this point because they are not exposed. As much as we talk about um, to, other, to other kids who are living in other situations. And so um, that is part, I suspect, of what the DISD and the city need to look to, to, uh, forward to. And it's a huge aha moment for everyone when you have the city and the Dallas Independent School District working together. Other communities have those working together because the mayor might be very involved in both, both areas. We do it differently here. So we have to approach things from an interconnected, different point because maybe we have siloed things. Yeah, go ahead. I think, you know, you know you, uh, she brings up a great point is that uh, looking where um, poverty happens um, and, and how do we begin to ameliorate that. But I think in terms of sort of health issues, um, if we sort of uh, sort of look at it, our, our major one, <clears throat> um, uh, our, our top um, indicator of morbidity and mortality in Dallas is going to be cardiovascular disease, mm -hmm. um, heart attacks and strokes, um, uh, hypertension, uh, not real sexy things to talk about, but it's knocking out a large part of our population. And so the things that I want to be interested, I'm, I'm interested in sort of being forward thinking is where is obesity, um, where is high blood pressure, um, where are, are people not getting exercise? Because that's where we're going to be able to predict who are the next people who are going to get heart attacks uh, and strokes. I think that's a great point, and I think that obesity probably is a factor in a lot of these, a lot of these concerns. So what do you do with that, data, what, with that data? What are some ideas with what you could do? Say you could identify, and we do have an idea of zip codes where you're much more likely to be obese, where there, are a, where there is a food desert, where there isn't access to ability to walk around. What do you do with that? There's a lot of things that you have to do, and it depends on where your community is at in terms of their engagement with the issue. So if you look to the world of risk communication and talking about risk, there's, um, there's a great 
researcher, academic in this area, Peter Sandman, and he says that anything that people are concerned about in health, any sort of risk, can be viewed on a scale where you've got two axes. And on one, you've got the actual sort of danger itself is this particular health threat, obesity, you know, how, how, dangerous, how dangerous is it? And on the other scale, you have how much does the community care about this? And so many of the health issues that we're facing are issues where it's a very high hazard, but as Sandman calls this other access, outrage, low outrage. The public isn't concerned about this. Instead, a lot of people are sort of misplacing their, their interest and their concern in things that are actually low hazard and high outrage. And Ebola was a perfect example of that. Whereas, you know, obesity, cardiovascular disease is in this totally other quadrant. And so what uh, health change theorists have looked at is how do you move people to care? And depending on where their engagement of that issue is at, you need to use different strategies. So the very first step is just getting people aware of this issue, putting it on their radar. The second step is getting them to see how it relates to their everyday life. Next, you have to inspire them to action. Next, you have to give them the tools to act. And then after that, you have to make sure that action is sustainable and that it's being maintained. So depending on where a community's you know, needle sits on, on the dashboard, you might need to go in with an educational campaign. You might need to go in, if a community's ready to act, you need to go in and give them the tools to be able to act. Maybe they're already acting and you need to say, let's make this program sustainable. It's going to be different for every issue, but assessing where people are on that, that behavior change continuum has got to be the first step. And I think in some ways we already have an idea of where there are problems and what the problems are. And we're almost a little bit blasé about it. We know that we're in the midst of a huge obesity epidemic and diabetes epidemics. So there may not be outrage about that or even outrage that, hey, those epidemics are really concentrated in areas of high poverty. But if you have access to all those data sets and you can overlay the maps of here in Dallas are the areas where kids are more likely to be obese. Here are the areas where kids are more likely to have um, kidney disease or, you know, manifest stations of diabetes and then overlay that with maps that tell you about those areas. So that's why I'm saying we need access to all the data sets because the way you get outrage is by saying to people, look, here's where the kids with diabetes live. There are no green spaces. There are no parks there. There are no places that sell fresh produce and vegetables. There are high crime rates also in this area. This is, these are the things that the data shows us and parents, you back that up with, with you know, talking to people and narratives and them saying that I bought my kids bikes. I spent a lot of money on them, but it's not not safe for them to ride their bike up and down our street because it's a high crime area. So again, it's about connecting those dots and using the data to drive policy. It is hard to educate people in the sense that you can educate people about how important it is to be eating vegetables and to be using the streets. But if you have no stores that are near you or um, to get those carrots and to get the fresh fruit um, and, and they're old, I, you know, it's, and, and you're working two jobs because you have a two 30 hour a, a, a week, you know, jobs because you can't find a full time job that pays the benefits and you're living week to week on just trying to make that uh, rent for a substandard housing. Um, that's part of what we call with the toxic stress. So you can tell people about this, but it, if it, you make it so impossible for them to be able to be follow the education that they believe in. I mean, there are none of these parents that want their kids obese, none of these parents that wouldn't want their children to, to, to be living incredibly healthy lives, but um, we don't make it very easy. And if for any of you who haven't been into some of the southern sectors of our community where there are stores that are selling um, diapers, just per diaper, not a box, um, but are selling them singly um, because people don't have the money to be able to buy an entire box of diapers. Can you imagine, you know, getting a, a banana that's four days old and doesn't even look that good and you're supposed to be spending extra money on it? One, it's hard. You know, I, I think we need to change the political discourse in this state. Um, when the, the, you know, <laughs> when all our politicians seem to want to do is just flip the bird at Washington um, and take a stance on how can we stick it to the feds, um, I'd rather they give a shit about the kids of Dallas. Um, and... Um, 
And that would be some of the big corporations here as well. Um, the people that have got the money and the power can use it. And they can use it for the sake of the, the public. Um, and when we privatize everything and think it's all about individuals, what that means is our community suffers. Um, and we need political leaders and people of power that can change the expectations and say that we expect to have a healthy state. And we expect to all be in this together and we're gonna make some changes. Um, and that conversation doesn't happen um, and that's a problem. Um, you can look at a state like Colorado and they have a Colorado Health Foundation and the people of power and the people in politics care. And so Colorado as a state has everybody at the table. Um, what's frustrating um, as a nonprofit is we can try every kind of little intervention in the world in these communities, but we can't get the people who could make big policy change to care about the people we care about. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I've done as a, as a discipline um, is sometimes I park my car and instead of using that freedom to get somewhere, I, I submit to DART. And so I've gone on business trips where I have to take <laughs> DART from my office downtown to Love Field, fly somewhere, come back. It's fascinating what you learn. One time I, I got in from a, a trip to Austin and I sprint to catch the shuttle and the bus driver starts laughing because it doesn't leave immediately. It waits for all the people that work there to close down. So here I am huffing and puffing and everybody else is just chilling because this is their nightly ritual. And I watched this little community of you know, low wage workers at Love Field get on the dart tram to take their little trip to the dart station and I enter into their world. And these are working people. These, you know, there's a mom calling to check and see how her kids are doing at nine o'clock at night, when, see how their day is as she's getting off work. There are these people having conversations that they have every night as a community. I enter into their world. They don't have a voice in Austin. They don't have a voice too often in Dallas. Um, and until they get a voice in the halls of power and until our politicians, and we're complicit because somehow we're letting them get elected. That's got to stop. I, I couldn't be, you know, uh, more in agreement about that. The, um, I think, you know, you talk about how we're going to uh, change this for our communities. It's really um, communities being empowered to change it for themselves. Um, we have, we cannot look at politicians, we cannot look at politics to change it. It's communities that have to change this. Um, we, we have communities that will vote against their own self-interests. Um, and so when, when communities are voting against their own self-interest, politicians are going to do what they're going to do. We need to uh, begin electing politicians that are going to be supporting the kind of health changes that we need in the communities, and that's the community that has to say, we won't take it anymore. That's what's fascinating is once they're held accountable, man, it's, it's amazing what they care about. Uh, you know, I mean, it's, and then you see these collectives in other, other states where the public and private spheres come together, foundations pour millions of dollars in, the corporations contribute and say, we'll, we'll be a part of changing the public space. Uh, we're gonna have to have more of that in the state of Texas. Um, it, we're too privatized and, and too individualized. And the state of Texas, the city of Dallas in particular, we're talking a lot about poverty here, but there's a lot of wealth here. There's a lot of wealth in this area. What's gone wrong? Why is that wealth, those donations, not having an impact. We have the highest disparity, actually, between the haves and have-nots uh, per, per the Urban Institute of any city in America larger than 250,000, just to level set for you. Wow. And, and I was thinking, is you notice, I'm relatively new to Dallas, only been here about 18 months, you notice, because it's very apparent that there is affluence here, and then should you get on the dot, then you realize, you know, there are other communities here as well, living side by side. You talked about politics, though, but another thing that you notice when you're new to Dallas, and this is good and bad, is that it's a very business-driven place. So yes, politicians have some power, but businesses have a lot of power. So how do we hold them accountable to really put their money where their mouth is? Because some of them will write reports, they will talk about the disparities and childhood poverty and they're all very concerned, but what are they doing about it? Yeah, you know, we get that oftentimes where the banks and others will, they'll write a report about, well, we have a, a skills gap or we need to, to have, and, and that's great and I appreciate that work, but then when are we going to have a corporate relocation to a part of town that really needs redevelopment? You know, why do the haves always go to where the haves already are? <laughs> Um, 
and so I, I would love a corporation to say, as a part of our view of profit, you know, not, we're not just going to write reports and tell you how bad the problem is. We're going to do something bold and courageous to change it, and we're going to move somewhere you would have never dreamed of. I'm waiting for that kind of uh, courage and vision and leadership from a corporate leader um, that we've grown not to expect. But I think one of the things that, that if um, Ebola and Zika taught us nothing is that the haves can stay where the haves are, but the diseases are going to go there anyway. <laughs> um, and so it's really in the self-interest of the haves to help the have-nots. It's really sad that we have to paint it that way, right? That you should care about hepatitis and HIV or TB because even though they're not where you are right now, we are a very, you know, porous society. We all intermingle. Those things will affect you. Um, can I use that as a quick transition point to talk about mental health? Yes. Um, do you guys know what the largest mental health facility in the state of Texas is? <laughs> yeah, it's Dallas County Jail. Um, and that's second only to the, obviously, the first largest mental health facility in the state, and that would be Harris County Jail. So, I mean, I was thinking of that because I was thinking about we often don't talk about prisoner health. That's a huge swathe of the population here in the U.S. You know, more people are incarcerated here than in any other country in the world, proportionally. And we don't care about those diseases that, diseases that affect prisoners either, such as TB, HIV, and hepatitis, because, oh, but those are people that, you know, we lock them away and we throw away the key. No, those are the people that you might be sat next to on the dart. People are constantly being, you know, let out and there's recidivism. So we need to think about not just our health, people sitting right here, but prisoner health and that, how that impacts public health too. And that kind of follows from the skills gap that John was alluding to as well and mentioning. And that is how many times in this conversation have we heard the Dallas schools need to do this? They need to have the <laughs> nurses. They need to, you know, it's the foods. They need. So we've put so much incredible pressure on these, these kinds of, of, of governmental entities to do all of what they're supposed to do. And by the way, they're supposed to be educating these kids as well. And part of that is because we have this extraordinary poverty levels in our community. But I think what was important with the comment that was made by the person that said, this looks like this, the statistics that we saw in Dallas, uh, in, in Detroit rather, the reason that that's important is that when you create these kinds of skills, skill gaps, it does affect the entire community. I mean, how many people are you gonna be able to bring in from California to be doing this work? At a certain point, if we are going to be as strong as our weakest link, and if we cannot rely on what we're seeing in our community because we have put so many pressures, so many kinds of obstacles in front of these children, then how strong is our community going to be in the next decade? That's the big question that we're talking about now. How do we break that cycle? Because if we don't, there are consequences when you have such a huge difference between the haves and have-nots. Yeah, I also think one of the things that, that Russell Simmons said in the last panel um, is that um, all this is about learning, all this is about growing, all this is about progress. And we can look at Detroit and sort of say, you know, we are where they were 10 years ago. Well, we don't have to be where they are 10 years from now if we learn and if we do something different. And I think that's one of the things that we're talking about um, is doing something different, being able to really rely on communities, understanding the importance of data, um, doing things that are different uh, than have been done before, uh, looking at um, our political system um, as um, a, a way that actually can help us, because um, often it, it doesn't. I want to open it up. You don't have to come right now, but if you have a question, please do come to the microphone so that we can make sure we have time to, to answer them or share your story about barriers to access to health um, in Dallas as well. That might give us ideas for what kind of data could be helpful uh, to collect. So let's start right here. Okay, thank you. Um, we have data on climate change and projections of extreme heat. We saw what happened in Chicago in 1995 and Europe in 2003. Would anyone like to speak to the need to anticipate the impacts of extreme heat events on our vulnerable populations, the ill, the elderly, and the poor? Thanks. 
This is in, incredibly important. We actually do this in British Columbia, where I'm from. You don't necessarily think of Canada as being an extreme weather place, except when it's you know, cold in the other direction. But we noticed exactly the same thing. We do have extreme heat events. They do affect, exactly as you said, our most vulnerable populations. So that was a case where we in British Columbia used predictive analytics to say, OK, well, you know, what's the weather forecast? What are the areas of the city that are going to be hardest hit? We've also developed a similar system. We get forest fires every year, um, and we have an alert system that goes out for asthmatics because we know there's going to be a, a, an issue in air quality. So you really need to say, okay, this problem's only going to get worse. Climate change is just changing. It, it's it's we we can't turn it around now. So you have to come up with a strategy where, like, okay. Where in the city is this going to matter the most? You know, there's going to be the places where the haves are that are full of air conditioners, and it's not going to affect people so much there. Where are we going to actually need to place our cooling centers? How far in advance are we going to need to get the message out to our residents in that community? You can't use, we're talking in most cases about the elderly, you can't use, you know, a, an SMS text <laughs> message alert to reach them. You need to come up with a strategy. You know, you need to mobilize a team to go and knock on doors. You need a transportation strategy to get people to the cooling center. It's like you have to be thinking about this now and think about it too in terms of the other impacts of climate change beyond uh, just heat related events. We're talking about it's severe impacts on food security. I mean, a lot of what you're seeing in the exodus from Syria is due to drought. This was a country that wasn't anticipating a drought. It happened, crops disappeared, and, and destabilization followed. You're seeing the same thing with emerging infectious diseases. I mean, every time there's a, a shift in the temperature upwards, new vectors, mosquitoes, move into an area. You've got to be thinking about how's this going to play out across all of the different areas. I, I'll just say I was on a, a working group with um, some folks from the city of Dallas that that's their job is they do kind of contingencies and risk assessment um, and so they try to anticipate what could you know affect us from in a term you know in terms of resiliency um, and when they looked at natural disasters extreme heat and lack of water were the two that are most you know most likely to affect us and so they're trying to come up with contingencies about how we're going to handle that so I don't know what those solutions are but I know somebody's actually working on that for this city Go ahead. Um, the other day I watched a, a TED talk on a uh, simple way to break a habit, Judson Brewer. Um, his basic, his, his intent was about mindfulness and awareness. Um, hmm. My big idea in, on, the, on the front of this bad habit of an uh, unhealthy city is um, instead of teaching food pyramids, BMIs, uh, why, why don't we turn our children and and their parents into diagnosticians and, uh, and teach them the symptoms of an unhealthy city. Um, and so my question to you is how do we use big data um, to identify the major symptoms of an unhealthy city? To the major, say, say that last line a little bit closer to the microphone. I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch it. Um, how do we use big data to identify the major symptoms of an unhealthy city? For me, driving around our neighborhood or other neighborhoods or just driving around Dallas, I see a uh, dialysis center and I automatically just think, wow, I don't have one of those in my neighborhood. Why are they here? And um, after doing some of the research, find out that that's one of the symptoms of an unhealthy city. I mean, just taking a walk here is impossible. I <laughs> thought I'd be good and take a walk from the Dallas Morning News to a, a meeting I had at lunch the other day that was in Farmer's Market. Mm. Great, it's a mile. It's going to take me 15 to 20 minutes. I nearly got hit by a car at three points because not only did the sidewalk end, but it ended really abruptly. Like one second you're on it and the next second you're not. And then where there was sidewalk, it was broken. It was really dangerous. Even where we live now, um, it's hard taking the dog for a walk sometimes. And that's as an able-bodied person. What does somebody in a wheelchair do? I mean, mm -hmm. to me, those are really huge symptoms of an unhealthy city. And so if we can collect, you know, we talk about big data, but if we have apps that can look at potholes in the roads and we can fix things like that, that just stop people being mobile. I mean, we can do a lot to improve the health of the city. And, and just you know, along with that, and the, I think one of the things that's critical is that we need to sort of start where we are. Um, and start where we are is, is about data, but start where we are to move to action is about up here. What are, what are people concerned about? What are people willing to do something about? 
And that's where we start. I love that idea of driving around and kind of mm -hmm. thinking about those. I had one of those moments. I went with somebody from um, Habitat for Humanity, and we were looking at some of the areas in South Dallas, and it was near Bonton. You've seen some of those, I'm sure, in great Dallas Morning News coverage. But um, I noticed a number of um, sofas and just stuff that were thrown out in, in front of um, some vacant lots. And I thought about that, and the person was describing to me, said, well, when you go in your area, which I live further north, um, you know, you do have those bulk pickup days where you know you have to do a certain number of days before, and it's on that, you know, fourth week or whatever it is of the month. There, though, it's tied to your water bill. And so if there is a vacant lot and you don't have a landlord that they know is paying a water bill, the city doesn't pick up those um, discarded items. So that you'll see all these discarded items, which I would assume would be a nice breeding ground for bad <laughs> things in this area that is just sitting there that's gotten water and it's, it's, it's just accumulating. But that's one of those policy thing changes I hadn't even thought about, that it was tied to a water bill. And if you have nobody, a landlord or owner who has a water bill, the city doesn't pick up and it just sits there. Yeah, data will tell you what but your heart and your head tell you why. So as much as you need to collect that big data and look for those symptoms, you need to be out there walking, you need to be out there driving around neighborhoods and saying, all right, what does this mean? Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I've been here since 1973, and I, I, I do think Dallas is a healthier city in many ways than it was when I moved here. Um, my concern, for if we could just for a minute, think about the other end of the spectrum, which is uh, people in my generation, over 60, we have this huge demographic, and it seems to me we've developed the same kind of approach where we're looking for efficient solutions to something that's, that needs a human solution. And so I've been to dozens of you know, old folks' homes and retirement communities and privatized apartment buildings and secluded you know, safe neighborhoods, and none of those are interesting to me. I, I would hate to be in any of them, as good as they are. You know, it just doesn't seem human to me, and I, I know it's a complex problem, but any, is there any hope uh, that we could create a place where you could be young and needy and be old and needy and, and have the community embrace you and be a part of it. Thank you. It's hmm. a powerful question. I almost want to just let that sit. I mean, you know, it's, <laughs> it's better than any response will probably get. I, I think that vision is very compelling. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think um, my sense is if if we were to walk the streets of many of our neighborhoods and actually get to know people, that that would be the solution many people would want. And so I think um, maybe there's hope that in some kind of design thinking, we bring the right humans to the table uh, to help us think through, uh, you know, I, as with most things in this country, um, housing for an aging population becomes big business. Um, and so there's a, it's going to mean how are there some entrepreneurs that can maybe change the business model, I think, um, and patch together communities in a way that's, that's more healthy. But um, I think there's something really compelling to think about communities of, that are integrated generationally. There are ways of doing it well. If any of you have read Atul Gawande's book, Being Mortal, um, he actually cites some examples that are based in the US and based overseas as well, because there are models where you can provide services to people who, who need certain services, but they themselves still remain empowered, which is really important. And we're going to have to think harder about this. Aging is, I like to think of it as a new frontier in public health. You know, I tell my students that we used to think of society as being shaped like a pyramid with, you know, very few older adults at the top. And now we talk about the rectangularization of society because we're living longer so we need to do a better job at, from a public health angle of looking at issues like dementia and just aging overall and providing those kinds of services and housing while making sure people have their dignity and remain empowered is the next big challenge. You know I, I guess maybe I think back um, being a Latina who um, grew up, I'm, I learned Spanish before English because we lived with my grandparents when my parents had gotten married and I, you know, I, I, I maybe grew up in a, in a generation and maybe in a culture that had, it was just assumed that if, when a grandparent would be living with the family and um, I think back of some of the most wonderful experiences in my own life of being uh, transformed by those that were and had had the experiences. I mean, they came from Mexico looking to this, you know, great American dream. And 
I think some of what they gave me and, and gave me the, that kind of vision and dream um, is something I still carry. And I think that perhaps is something I hope kids don't lose and that families don't lose because maybe that was one of the best parts of my upbringing culturally that um, I think we should be able to extend to everyone. It was, it was just, it was a wonderful experience for me and something I still treasure. All right, let's go to the next question here. Okay, I have two quick questions. Um, well, the first one actually is not so quick. I have been working in public education as a teacher and administrator for the past 23 years. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and what I have seen a great deal of, um, well, first of all, as, as a teacher, I cannot tell you how many times it was virtually impossible to teach to a child who had a throbbing toothache but didn't have access to dental care. And then, of course, with health care issues, that would be addressed by a, a, a physician. Um, most recently, we have seen more children being covered with health insurance, which is wonderful. However, they seem to be um, sort of not looked at as the whole child. They're not being looked at as an individual student, a child, a person, or a patient. And in my own situation with healthcare, I've, I've noticed this too. They tend to, first of all, have difficulty finding a primary care physician, and then when they do find one, they're sort of sent out for each individual symptom. And as a result, the school nurse will often be seeing a student thinking there is something chronic going on or there's something systemic, you know, this, there's something connected. But because the child is being seen by so many different specialists, all the puzzle pieces aren't being put together. And so it'll take years sometimes for children to be suffering before somebody stands back and makes the connection. It's oftentimes when it gets to a critical point in their health. And I, I'm just wondering, I guess basically my question is, do you see that there's a trend towards looking at patients, especially children, as whole people rather than just isolated symptoms? And then also, my last question, I would assume, especially being in Dallas, that we have so many pharmaceutical companies with so much wealth, obviously, by all the ads on television, but do the data that they collect, I would think that that would be an abundance of data in order to develop the drugs and then to follow up with their side effects. Do they share that data with public health? So those are my two questions. Thank you. <laughs> Who wants to take the first? Do they share their data, which I'm assuming the answer is The no. answer is pretty much no. A few companies are starting to release some of their clinical trial data, but it's very closely guarded is the quick answer. It just it doesn't happen. We're seeing a slight shift with Zika where we're talking about open access, like, hey, this is a public health emergency. If you're doing research in Singapore on Zika, please share it with researchers who are working in the US or the UK. And this is like, whoa, revolutionary. We should have been doing this you know, forever, but we're started, starting to see a shift with that, at least in terms of in the midst of a public health emergency. I'll say in our experience in working with healthcare systems in, in low-income communities, there's there's an understanding that the best practice model is to uh, give families and children a medical home. Uh, but um, I think, so I, I would say we're seeing some promising signs of healthcare systems moving into neighborhoods of high need um, and locating themselves there. Um, they're also using technology to do telemedicine and other things like that um, in episodic cases. Uh, that just takes the burden off families of having to you know, get off work, get the kid to the doctor, that kind of thing. But um, your experience is very common, and there are some you know, broken places in our healthcare system. What we see is the healthcare systems have a financial incentive to, to I mean, theoretically, they want people to, to have a medical home, and that's the best way to do population health. And they also have a financial incentive to keep people out of their ED. They have a financial incentive when it comes to specialty care to not get into that game. Because it's, it's one thing to give a, a low-income family a, a medical home for primary care. It's another if they, wanna, you know, if they need a liver transplant and we're not going to get full reimbursement. Um, and so there's a huge disconnect, I think, between primary care and specialty care. They get better primary care. There's more access to that. 
then there is specialty care. So, but, but what happens a lot of times is once you need a specialist, we're out. Um, and so I think that's a, that's a very common problem for low-income families. And it's broken and, sorry, separated across the board. I remember having a patient with TB once, and as we're treating the TB, I remember telling a senior colleague, this patient's teeth are really black. And being told, yeah, well, you're not a dentist, you just deal with the TB, they can go see a dentist later. And you're like, wait, what? As if like their oral health won't affect their physical health, as if their physical health won't affect their mental health. So we have these really artificial, unnatural separations that we need to start thinking about people and systems holistically. Dental care is harder to get into for nonprofits yeah. to try to fill the gap just because the overhead's so high. So it, you'll see it's much more common for there to be primary care clinics than dental clinics, although there is some work being done there. But some of them are even business models based on having a, you know, your public insurance, which then gets into the lack of providers in this state. The other part the of it is the whole, re <laughs> oh, sorry, the whole reimbursement system, too. Um, you don't really get reimbursed for preventive care. Uh, you're get, you will get reimbursed for the malady or the issue. Um, and so, again, even a nonprofit has to be able to say, well, this is a bottom line issue. So that's part of our policy problems that we have that we haven't done that. You, know, you mentioned teeth, but think about the vision issues. I have heard that from many people that, you know, you will see children who are acting out, can't do, and then you find out, well, it's because I haven't been able to see what you've got in, in front of you. And, you know, they're bored and, and, you know, all of the things that you can just imagine. But some of that does come back to the way we reimburse in our country for these issues. And we just don't think of the prevention side as as important um, a, a policy issue as well. Something we think about. I think that's hopefully something that the Affordable Care Act will help us move us towards is more prevention um, um, as providers um, um, try to keep people out of the emergency room and certainly even out of the doctor's office by giving them uh, routine care. There, I think there has been some shift, but it's been interesting in the state of Texas because what's happened is there's been raised hopes because of the Affordable Care Act, and we have had more people have insurance, but then you have the problem of finding a doctor, and there's a severe lack of primary care doctors. As you mentioned, they get paid about 65 cents to the dollar for Medicaid reimbursement for seeing people, so um, there are limits in that area, and that, you know, a law, it's the problem is the law can't do it all. We need the state to also act as well. Maybe like accepting Medicaid expansion? That's an example. <laughs> so. well, well, I think the other thing that, that we're also seeing is that, um, you know, because people now have more access, we're flushing, flushing out problems that were already there. So we're beginning to see yes. more um, uh, disorders, see more problems. That doesn't mean that they weren't there before. It's just Very that people true. didn't have access before and they just died. Very true. Let's go to one more question here. Yeah, um, I, first of all, I want to thank you for, for alerting us to the, three, the 311 app, because I actually downloaded it just now <laughs> and made a report on something. It was, it's actually very useful. And I think that's one way to get citizens more involved in sharing data. But I think there's a larger issue that, um, that the presentation last night highlighted, which is siloing data. And I, I went to an event very recently on, on, uh, on SMU's campus, I think Eric, you were there as well, where um, we had a city manager or, or city officials say that they, ha they, they have all this information, but different agencies in the city or in the county, they don't share the data. I mean, they, 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 they have it, they have tons of it, but there, there's no initiative to get people to share data across agencies. And so identifying problems, predicting problems becomes extremely difficult, if not impossible. So what does it take actually to break down these silos? Does it require leadership from the mayor, from the from county boards? What does it require? Thank you. Great question. Well, I think one of the things it requires uh, is, is a will, mm -hmm. um, um, that uh, people can begin to um, speak the language of the other agency and begin to say, it's actually the exact same problem. Uh, you refer to the, um, the initiative that SMU has with the city of Dallas. I think it's a great initiative because what it is is that you have uh, researchers who have um, skills um, and you have Dallas that actually has some challenges. Um, I, I recently had um, my, my group of students beginning to work with the Dallas Police Department around um, K2, um, which is a synthetic marijuana because it's a major problem and they actually have the data and they're trying to tackle it. These are health students, but they realize that the police department is actually trying to do something to, to stop it. And I think uh, building those kinds of bridges between um, communities and people who think differently but actually are focusing on the exact same problems of what we need to begin doing.
And you can imagine, no wonder that it was a front page story, this um, partnership now between the city of Dallas and the Dallas Independent School District. I mean, it's an intergovernmental approach that we have to start thinking. And that really was a red letter day to, to see that. And I was glad the morning news put that as a front page story. All right, we're gonna have to wrap up for the Healthy City, I'm sorry, but we are gonna continue the discussion today and we'll have a summary this evening as well. Don't leave because the educated city is gonna be here on this stage next. Thank you so much. Thank you guys.